When your patient has a spine dysfunction or injury, your specific examination, evaluation of your examination findings, and your treatment should be as specific as possible to be custom tailored for that patient's problem. That way you can best assure that your treatment is going to be most specific for their impairments. It's also going to be very helpful for you to differentially diagnose what would be a normal problem treated by physical therapy from things that are not treatable by physical therapy, possibly more serious medical problems. One of the most important jobs that we have as a physical therapist in our examination is to rule out uh, non-mechanical or systemic origins of pain. We want to make sure that the patient is in our care and we can take care of them and they don't need to be referred to a medical practitioner. We're looking for red flags. We're also trying to determine if there might be neurologic signs or symptoms that might affect how we treat that patient. We're also looking at psychological issues that may affect the patient presentation. Yellow flags or differences in their behavior we're going to look more uh, closely at Waddell's behavioral signs a little bit later in our patient examination. Basically, it's really important to determine if that patient has anything that could be uh, creating problems that is not appropriate for physical therapy. There are a few medical conditions that commonly occur and can cause pain in the low back that mimics musculoskeletal pain. These conditions include malignant tumors, back infections such as osteomyelitis, spinal fractures, cardioquina syndrome, and abdominal aneurysm. The next two slides provide a brief overview of the red flags associated with each of these conditions. For example, tumors are more likely in individuals over age 50. The risk increases if there is a personal history of cancer. Pain that is constant or worse at night is also associated with cancer-associated low back pain. Unexplained weight loss is another red flag for cancer that's important to keep in mind. It's always important to ask in the medical history about recent infections. Individuals with a history of infections on or near the back may be at risk for infections um, that are causing back pain. Urinary tract infections or skin infections are commonly associated with the onset of osteomyelitis. Fever, chills, and malaise are also flags indicating possible infection to um, pay attention to in the history and maybe specifically um, asked for is a better way to go about that. Rigidity of the spine um, presenting as loss of accessory motion and limited active motion um, may also be present with infections in the back. Um, significant muscle guarding would be the source of that rigidity. So it may be visible as well as palpable as well as evidence on the movement examination. Compression of the cauda equina can occur from a tumor in the area or from narrowing of the canal due to degenerative or traumatic changes. Red flags for this syndrome include a history of spinal stenosis and or degenerative disc disease, anything that creates narrowing of the spaces. Um, associated uh, flags include urinary retention or urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, um, anesthesia in the saddle area, the pelvic floor, global and or progressive uh, weakness in the lower extremities is also associated with this syndrome as well as sensory and motor deficits generally more in the distal aspects of the lower extremity and um, maybe bilateral or unilateral. Red flags associated with abdominal aneurysm include a history of peripheral vascular disease, PVD, or cardiovascular disease, CVD. Patients with an abdominal aneurysm um, will have low back pain that is not necessarily related to movement, so it may be um, constant or a pattern that really doesn't, again, associate with any particular movement pattern. Um, it's not covered in this course, however, in other courses you will learn to assess the abdomen for an aortic bruit or increased width of the aortic pulse using um, um, manual exam um, as well as um, your um, um, sphygmomanometer. Spinal fractures are also a concern um, and are not always detected prior to patients beginning physical therapy, even those with a medical referral. 
any history of recent trauma, which could be a minor trauma if the patient has osteoporosis, um, is a red flag for a fracture. Uh, also pay attention to long-term steroid use as another risk factor for fractures, and age over 70 is associated with um, increased fracture risk as well. On physical examination, uh, if there is a fracture present, exquisite local tenderness will be noted on palpation, and there may also be local edema. Um, generally, with a fracture, pain will also be noted to increase with weight bearing. Um, so those are, those are uh, that is a summary of uh, the red flags for commonly occurring medical conditions that can mimic musculoskeletal low back pain. Gordon Waddell, an orthopedic surgeon, made some important contributions to physical therapy and really within the treatment of uh, spinal pain sufferers uh, worldwide. He came up with some behavioral signs. Now what these were really trying to do is trying to look at the cause of back pain and try to determine if these were indeed mechanical problems. You see the eight different items above. If we have essentially three or more of the above findings, then we can possibly assume that this problem is non-mechanical in nature. Now the person that may be uh, eliciting these symptoms or these behavioral signs uh, might be out for secondary gain. They might not wish to be working or they may feel that they need to demonstrate some sort of disability. Sometimes we see this in workers' comp patients and sometimes within the military, uh, but we'd like to believe that most of our patients are indeed genuine about their pain. Unfortunately, we have to use some behavioral signs like this to determine if they're not. First of all, overreaction. Inappropriate overreaction, that is. Uh, somebody that might say that their back is killing them and having an exaggerated emotional response, possibly jumping off a table, uh, might be somebody that demonstrates an overreaction to your examination. Simulated axial compression. Now what this is, is giving gentle compression through the head shouldn't cause back pain because you're not giving enough force. But if a person that seemingly has symptoms with this simulated compression is probably demonstrating a behavioral sign. Simulated rotation is similar. So having a patient stand with their feet firmly planted and then rotating the entire body essentially not rotating the spine, maybe initiating at the hips, and if that person has uh, symptoms or reports symptoms with this, they may be demonstrating an abnormal behavioral sign. Regional sensory disturbance. This is when a person doesn't really display any specific dermatomal or myotomal pattern. So let's say if the arm that they're complaining of is completely numb, this doesn't necessarily respond to specific nerve root problems they would be said to have a regional sensory disturbance. A distracted straight leg raise, or SLR. Now, sometimes when you test a patient, let's say several physicians have maybe performed a straight leg raise in the supine position, if the patient knows that you're testing a specific nerve, they may only let you lift their leg a small amount. So a way to distract the patient to determine if they have the same amount of straight leg raise is to do it with a patient sitting on the edge of the bed or a chair and then extending their knee. If they can extend their knee fully, that's essentially almost a 90 degree straight leg raise and therefore they would be positive for displaying a distracted straight leg raise. Manual muscle testing. This is important as well. If somebody has a cogwheel type resistance to manual muscle testing, this is definitely abnormal and not indicative of any specific musculoskeletal or neurologic problem. This demonstrates the sincerity of effort may not be all there. If tenderness is non-anatomic when you're palpating landmarks, if it makes no specific sense, or if somebody has very much superficial tenderness to palpation, this may be considered to be a Waddell behavioral sign. Also, if you're seeing several of these, you know that something might not be quite right. This person may have some psychosocial issues going on that affects treatment. Often the Waddell's behavioral signs uh, are included in a functional capacity evaluation or an FCE. I felt that I should at least mention this. 
An FCE is really meant to test a person's uh, physical and functional ability in a number of different tasks. This may directly relate to their work environment, their home environment. These are typically used to determine if somebody is able and or safe to perform certain functions, including that of their job. This is another way in which we can substantiate somebody's function in the midst of an injury or perceived injury. Another commonly used assessment tool in the examination of patients with low back pain is the Fear Avoidance Belief Questionnaire, commonly referred to as the FABQ. The FABQ measures patients' fear of pain and their resultant avoidance of physical activity because of their fear. There are two scales in the FABQ, a work subscale and a physical activity subscale. Um, these scales um, make it possible for the therapist to identify the patient's beliefs about how both work and physical activity affect their low back pain and to gain some insight into how they're behaving um, at work and in, re and in regard to physical activity um, because of their pain. There is a strong relationship between elevated fear avoidance beliefs and chronic disability associated with low back pain. Um, evidence indicates that in patients with elevated fear, fear avoidance beliefs, multidisciplinary approaches are the best um, uh, way to approach management. Uh, multidisciplinary treatments including cognitive behavioral therapy, so reaching out to our psychology and counseling colleagues, as well as graded exposure to physical activity, um, something that would be monitored by the physical therapist. So attention to and the therapist remaining cognizant of um, the patient's fears associated with physical activity, perhaps work, and its impact on their low back pain. In your collection of data about the time of your history, one of the things you should evaluate are functional questionnaires, one of which being the Oswestry questionnaire. This is designed to interpret the patient's functioning outside of physical therapy during a number of different activities. This is in page 505 of your McGee text. There are 10 different categories, and disability is really scored out of 100 points. The lower the score equals less disability. This is a neat little tool because it can really estimate the percentage of disability that a patient has. This is a nice objective measure that is validated, and it's also sensitive to change. So if you were to do this both before, during, and after your physical therapy treatment, you can determine if the patient is getting better, getting worse, or staying the same. This is vital in either triggering a discharge, a, cha a change in your treatment plan, or referral to a medical practitioner. Perhaps one of the most important components of our examination is our history and the questions that we ask a patient. This is really no different than any other anatomical area that we examine. Certain questions are specific to the spine, including the lumbar and cervical spine. We need to know what's causing the problem. So we need to, o we need to give open-ended questions to the patient. If there's something of interest, we need to parallel or ask more questions based on the ones that they give us. We need to ask where is their pain and what type it is. Is it down the back, down the leg, down the buttock? Where is it? They need to point or draw on a diagram where they're getting their symptoms. We need to know the way in which they were injured. Was it gradual or was it traumatic? We need to know if their pain is getting better, getting worse, or staying the same. How did they make themselves better? How did they make themselves worse? What we're really looking for is a specific pattern to the pain. If there's no pattern and things don't make sense, it may be non-mechanical in origin. This is going to stimulate a, a, a medical referral, essentially. Red flag symptoms might include only pain that's experienced at night. We're also looking for paresthesias, numbness, tingling. That may indicate there may be a nerve at play. A cauda equina problem between S1 and S3 might give rise to paresthesias or numbness within the saddle region, or there might be bowel and bladder problems. 
it's important to know what the patient's history is in terms of their problem. Have they had this before? What other treatments did they get? What helped? What didn't? Are they seeing anybody else for this problem? Another physical therapist, a physician, a chiropractor, massage therapist? Are they taking any medications or supplements? What's their past medical history? Do they have any cardiac problems? What's their family history? Whether the patient is concerned with their pain or their function is significant in determining your goals for treatment. Other symptoms such as pain looking up, dizziness, inability to hold the head up, difficulty swallowing, gagging, pretty much everything that you can think about may be significant to the physical exam. You need to give your patient time to answer the questions completely and again parallel them. Draw out more information when you can. It's also important to know are they having any trouble with walking or balance. This could implicate the inner ear canal, central spine stenosis, myelopathy, or the like. Increases in intrathoracic uh, or abdominal pressure can cause more compression of the nerve root, and this applies to both the neck and the lumbar spine. We call that the valsalva if coughing or sneezing increases their symptoms. So you can see there's a myriad of questions that are very important uh, for these types of patients. This slide provides a reminder of the means we've introduced previously to assess pain. We make note of pain location as well as pain character, referring there to the descriptive words that patients use to describe their pain. We also pay attention to the behavior of a patient's pain with activity and rest. Uh, we measure the intensity or severity of pain using tools such as pain scales um, or using pain scales that include specific scales such as numeric scales, picture scales, visual analog scales, and there are also word category scales um, that can be used to measure intensity uh, with words such as the pain is mild versus distressing versus horrible. We've also, um, in our curriculum, introduced uh, the McGill Multidimensional Pain Questionnaire, um, also known as the MPQ. This is one tool that's available that measures several dimensions of pain. <clears throat> the MPQ can, um, um, can measure pain location as well as pain intensity and pain descriptors. The <clears throat> uh, MPQ is valid and reliable. <clears throat> it's also been tested cross-culturally it's an excellent tool to get an in-depth insight into uh, pain being experienced by individuals who come to us with low back pain. The drawbacks are that it takes um, time to both administer and score the MP, uh, MPQ. However, it is commonly used in the assessment of low back pain. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to look at some specific uh, means of examining the lumbar spine. In doing a spinal examination, this incorporates a number of different uh, significant steps, all of which you're going to learn in the S1 course, 14 to be exact. But don't worry, this is going to be just a basic overview of what you're going to do in a lumbar spine examination. Typically with posture, you're going to begin by looking at a patient from behind. You're looking for anything uneven. So again, checking your bony landmarks, both visually and with palpation, is going to be significant. You're looking for any sort of a lateral shift or a scoliosis, a curvature of the spine. You'll also be comparing your views of the patient in the lateral view and also from the front. The physical exam of scoliosis incorporates a couple of different aspects, first of which is structure. When a person bends forward, as in the typical fashion when you examine scoliosis, you're looking initially for a rib hump. The ribs on one side of the thoracic spine will typically be higher, and this is due to the rotational component of the scoliosis. In standing, you may notice that the curve assumes a natural S shape. When there is a convexity within the spine, it generally has to straighten itself out to compensate, therefore forming an S. You would note that the curvature would say be to the left in the lumbar spine and then compensate with a right curvature in the thoracic spine. Active movements uh, would be evaluated as well. Typically side bending would be limited to the side of the convexity. Muscle length would be examined throughout the area as well as muscle strength. 
it's common to have weak muscles on the side of the convexity. There are differences in fiber types on the side of the convexity and the concavity, uh, which are a little bit difficult to uh, predict uh, based on research. A simple depiction of a subject with a scoliosis. Here you notice the S-curve and the picture of the spine itself superimposed upon the body. Here you see a sketch of an individual but with both a normal spine and a scoliotic spine. Notice the S-shaped curve as it compensates. You can see the forward bending as well as the rib hump. What you'd be looking for to name would be the rib hump on the right and the scoliotic spine. Again, that is in reference to the rotational component of the spine. Here we see an adolescent female with a right thoracic curvature. Her rib prominence is pretty obvious on forward bending. When you look at the radiograph, uh, it shows a right thoracic scoliosis. What's peculiar is something that's been done to make it easier on your eyes. The image has been flipped so that you can compare the spines when looking at it from the back. Remember, typically when you look at an x-ray or typically when a uh, radiologist is reviewing a radiograph, it's going to be termed the appropriate manner as if the patient is standing looking at you for the radiograph. Active range of motion is also going to be examined. We're looking for normal movement. Characteristics of normal movement include smooth, well-controlled movement, full, pain-free ranges of motion. We're looking for normal muscular length, and we're also looking for passive range of motion being greater than active range of motion. With forward bending, what we're looking at specifically is a good reversal of the lumbar curve, meaning the lordosis. We're looking for any deviations from one side to the other, which may indicate some restriction in either muscle or joint tissue. We're also looking at the quality of movement. Again, I mentioned smoothness is indicative of normal movement. Therefore, anything that would be aberrant, meaning shaking, catching, juddering could indicate some instability or a problem with neuromuscular control. Active range of motion should also be examined in side bending. We're looking for a symmetry of the curve. Does it curve nicely up in one direction and when they bend in the other direction does it look the same? Or perhaps could there be a sharp angulation of the curvature? This might be significant for a, an area of movement that is excessive. Rotation should also be looked at. Spinous processes are going to be compared. Does one move or rotate on another one symmetrically from rotation right to rotation left? You should also side bend to the opposite side when you rotate. This is a normal coupled motion in the lumbar spine biomechanically. Cervical spine active range of motion can be done in sitting or standing. We look at a couple of different uh, ways in which to measure the cer cervical spines, one of which is the subcranial motion, or the motion of the occiput on the neck. We're looking for slight tilts, side bending, forward and backward bending of this region. Looking for any uh, movement irregularity or dysfunction, or possibly some signs or symptoms from the patient uh, complaining of pain with any significant movements. Mid-cervical and upper thoracic motion should be evaluated as well. Forward bending, backward bending, rotation both directions, and side bending both directions should be examined. While examination and observation of active range of motion is important, so is obtaining an objective measurement for a number of reasons. We like to grade progress. We also like to document it for the insurance companies and for Medicare. What we're seeing here are two different forms of inclinometers, a digital and an analog. These can effectively measure spinal motion. It's important to examine a patient in the sitting position for a number of different reasons. First of all, with posture, rechecking the iliac crests. If there is a difference between standing and sitting tests, we might be able to determine that there may be 
something such as a leg length discrepancy, or possibly a rotated innominate bone. You can look at different components of the neurological exam in the sitting position as well. Myotomes and dermatomes can be tested, as well as reflexes, both for normal and abnormal reflexes. A Babinski sign can be tested with a good, firm lateral stroke down the lateral side of the foot on the plantar surface with the knee extended. We're simply looking for the big toe to flare, meaning there might be an upper motor neuron problem or damage. It's important to move to the supine position to check hip range of motion. Flexion and internal and external rotation are important as they link directly to the spinal movements. You can also perform a number of special tests to be specific with your examination. You can use the ASISs in order to produce an iliac gapping or compression. You can do a straight leg raise to check for neural mobility or irritation. By moving the knees to the chest or away from it, or pulling the knees out, you can compress on structures or distract on structures to determine if they provoke or alleviate pain. This is interesting to know in determining whether your issue might be a disc problem or related to another anatomical element. Leg length can also be examined in the supine position. You can use your uh, bony structures and your landmarks to determine leg length and also perform measurements uh, with a tape measure in this position too. Leg lowering tests can determine strength of the abdominal muscles and you can also do functional testing in this position. Finally, moving your patient into prone is an important component of your examination. Exposing the back. Special tests can be done in the prone position, such as propping up on the elbows in prone or repeatedly extending the spine. This is typically done to either provoke or alleviate a patient's symptoms. This determines a preference for a specific direction. This will help guide your treatment so that a patient can be doing exercises which may also help to alleviate pain, restore spinal curvatures, or reduce symptoms. Palpation is also very important in this position to establish relationships of bony landmarks, soft tissues, as well as provocation or alleviation of certain soft tissues and ligamentous structures. This concludes the uh, lumbar spine lecture for orthopedics. This is meant to be a brief overview of the spinal structures, examination, and treatment. Throughout your courses at the University of St. Augustine, you're going to get an extensive amount of experience in spinal structures, evaluation, and manipulation.